This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I wanna ride, 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 ride. Do you hear that whisper? That little voice that tugs at your heart, telling you to start living your best life. If that sounds like you, then now is the time to join Nectar Growth. It's the only place online where you can connect with and learn from great coaches with different areas of expertise. Why live another day not believing that you're enough, not seeing all that is possible for you? Why live another day dimming your own light? Nectar is the perfect place for you to discover the real you and uncover who you're meant to be. Life is a journey that we are not meant to walk alone. Nectar gives you a nurturing and supportive community to walk with you on your journey. Start living your best life and see what is truly possible. Come join us at NectarGrowth.com. You know you're worth it. As a mom, I know the challenges that come with raising two kids while balancing a career. It's only now that they're grown, living their own lives, that I feel like I have room to breathe. I had my husband, Jeff, right there at my side, so I wasn't going out alone. But what about all the women who are single moms? How do they fit it all in? Joining me today is Dorothy Kolb, a single mom of four sons, to share her story of going from zero to building a thriving business. Welcome to the roller coaster, Dorothy. Oh, thank you. Such an aptly named podcast for my life. <laughs> as as all. And I mean, and that's the thing, all of us, especially as mothers, balancing careers, and in your case, building a business, every day is a roller coaster. And you some you somehow have to get comfortable with not being comfortable, not knowing that it's all sorted out and in place and planned and prepared and, and what have you. Absolutely. I think that's the best thing you can let go of is the control of controlling everything. <laughs> it doesn't work out. It does not. So can you take me back to your beginning of being that single mom, raising four sons and trying to build your business? Yes. In fact, it, I was quite the accidental entrepreneur. I did not intend to be one. Um, I had a thriving corporate career for many years. And I, um, at the end of that career, though, I was working as a CFO for a company that was downsizing. And so they um, downsized me at exactly precisely the same time I was going through a divorce. So that was thrilling. Um, and I was leaving that marriage, not with alimony and child support and you know financial backing and even a nest egg of any kind. Um, so I literally started with probably closer to say less than zero. Um, and it really became a matter of having to just provide for my kids. I, you fall into this, I think as a parent, as a mom, this survival mode of, I just need to make it work and I'm going to make it work. And sure, yeah, I probably could have found another like, you know, nine to five job that we all know is not nine to five. <laughs> They're usually like, you know, I used to leave the house at seven in the morning and get home at 730 at night. And as a single parent, I didn't have that luxury anymore of being able to leave before they went to school and then not be here when they got home from school and then not be here when they, you know, for dinner and that kind of thing. And at that point in time, they were between like seven and 12. So definitely not where I could just, you know, you guys are on your own, you know, it's still, not the 1970s. Yeah, still, <laughs> it's the yeah, 1970s, still, it would have been, hey, yeah, sure, you're fine, yeah, don't worry about it. Some cracker jacks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seven to 12, that's still the age range where they still need mom there to get them up, get them ready for school. And then, 
you know, even be there when they get home from school and making sure homework and dinner and all of those things keep yes. moving forward. Yes. Yes. So I, you know, I was, I was just thinking like, nope, I cannot do that. So what can I do? And I've been playing around, you know, with some projects as a, as a, I'm a fractional CFO. So I do strategic accounting and business advisory. And I'd had a couple of projects over the years and I thought, well, maybe I'll do that. And what I actually had to start with doing was bookkeeping. And that was, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I had been a CFO. I had been a business manager of a TV station. I had worked at large, large companies, but, and that was taking a, a pretty big step backward for me, but it was what I could get. And I, you know, I filled in my schedule with, with that kind of work. And what was amazing was that those clients, two of whom I still have today, and this is five years ago, um, they realized what my skill set was. And luckily they both were, you know, wait a minute, I think you could do a lot more for us than you are. And that built the, the business there just with those two. And they referred me to others. And then I joined organizations um, such as Dreamers and Doers, um, The Upside, Female Founder Collective, and kind of got connected to other women who were founders. And I started to realize that that's really where I wanted to niche my business because women are a lot more collaborative. Women, when I bring an idea to them, they're not like, no, prove it to me first which I had run into so many times with men. And so I ended up with this market, this creative agency and actually, frankly, podcast production company market sectors that I worked with. And I focused on women owners because it was fun for me. And then I also realized that a lot of them didn't understand their financials as much as they should. You know, they just kind of counted on, you know, their accountants keeping them up to date or their tax person filing properly or whatever. And they didn't quite like, they didn't get into it and because they didn't understand it. They're creatives. They couldn't, they didn't want to look at numbers. It's scary. It's a scary place to be. And so I really realized that if I start to explain this, you know, their business, the financial part of their business to them in a way that they get, whether that's charts or graphs or narratives or whatever, that they became stronger business owners and their businesses did better. And then they were able to bring me on in a bigger capacity. And it just kind of built from there. And before I knew it, I shouldn't say that. It was not overnight at all. I've been doing this for five years. It was probably the first three years where we really, it was like, okay, guys, my boys, you know, we just have to be kind of, you know, we're not going to go crazy. And then the business built actually in the last two years, which is amazing considering a year and a half of it was pandemic. Um, to where I get referrals from, you know, from those clients to other like clients so that I'm still getting the same type of client that I like working with because they refer you to people like them. And that's how the business really built. It sounds like you sort of, you know, being here in Canada, we call it the hockey stick effect where you kind of truck yes. along and then all of a sudden you go up. <laughs> It did. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there were probably a little blips along the way. Yeah, you know? not quite. <laughs> Things are never straight. But going, going back to when you first made that step to take the bookkeeping jobs, that must have been a bit of a blow for you. So how did you manage those feelings that you had knowing what you were capable of, but having to basically start on the first rung of the ladder again. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a lot of mental gymnastics. Um, I think what wins out at the end is being, a, I, I always say being a mom, but it's being a parent. I, I know, you know, fathers are the same way. You get very protective of your kids. And that really became priority number one. What do I need to do to be present for them, to provide for them, and even if I have to go back and start small and build up again, that's just what we're going to have to do. And so, you know, it was just, it was really just turning off the ego and, and, and turning on the mom and saying, okay, you know, this is, it's just what I, I'm going to have to do. And I think because I stayed positive in that space and didn't make it to, oh my God, I hate bookkeeping. I hate my clients. I hate all this. The positivity 
went out into the universe, if you will, and came back to me, you know, tenfold. And I think that just the being in that positive mind space was really what worked the best for me. Now I speak to a lot of women and I'm going to include myself in this category where the concept of something like self-care is non-existent. <laughs> so I didn't even know what the word meant until I would say maybe four or five years ago, truly understood what it meant. So I'm sure that you had to build some sort of elements of sort of self-care into your life in, in some way that, you know, help feed that positivity that you put out into the universe. How did you do that? What, what were some of the things that you were able to do? Does wine count? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for oh, your there honesty. Was, because... <laughs> there's a lot of wine involved. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I will be honest that in the first few years of it, when the, the kids are smaller, I mean, now they're, you know, I've got twins who are 19, a 17 year old and a 14 year old. And to be absolutely transparent here, two weeks ago, I was out of town for a full week. I went out to the West Coast. I live on the East Coast. I went out to California and spent the week. And because I have, you know, the two 19 year olds who are here, and the other two, you know, are, are mature enough. I was able to, you know, okay, everything's going to be good. I don't want to know if there were any parties. I came home to a house that looked relatively clean. The pets were still alive. <laughs> Nobody was in the hospital. <laughs> I figured I called it a success. But, you know, I, in the first few years, I was super guilty of no self-care, super guilty of that. My self-care was maybe I'd run in the morning, which was great. That's self-care. But, yeah. you know, it's like 45 minutes or something, you know. Um, but I, I truly, truly let myself fall at the very bottom of the ladder of priorities for caring. And that was not a good thing to do. It was definitely not a good thing to do, but I was so struggling and in that survival mode that it was just like, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. I kind of think of it as years and years ago, I was in Norway during winter, much like Canada, um, <laughs> And it was, it was below zero and there was like, I don't know, six feet of snow or whatever. And I had a walk from my, um, I think it was my hotel to the broadcast center. I was there for the Olympics. And I was just like trudging along and just like, I'm just going to keep going, keep going. Don't look at how far I have to go. I'm just going to keep going. And before I knew it, like I was there. And that's how I visualize how I got through the first probably three or four years of you know, being sick, you know, divorced mom was just keep going, keep going, keep going. I, you know, now that self-care is, a, you know, you said just in the last four or five years, we've kind of, everybody's embraced it a bit more. I would highly recommend that any woman, you know, going through the same thing takes that self-care seriously because, you know, like they say, you can't pour from an empty cup. My cup was like really low. Um, I, I don't know how I kept going, but, um, once I realized in the last few years that that was really important, I feel like I've been a better person to myself, to them, you know, my sons, um, to my clients, because I've been a more whole person and I haven't been as, oh my God, you know, everything is just crashing around me because it wasn't crashing around me. And I think it was because I took the time for myself to be grounded enough and solid enough to be able to do the other things. And I can definitely relate to that because, you know, when I say I didn't know what self-care was until four years ago, I, I, the concept of putting myself first in any situation was foreign because you have that guilt, you know, I should be doing this and I should be doing that and not realizing that if you're not putting yourself first, it's not selfish. But even if you're taking 10, 15, 20 minutes at the beginning of the day, just to make sure that you're right, it can completely have a different outcome on your day. Absolutely. And I tried all of it, you know, once I realized I was lacking, you know, the meditation and more wine and um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I found a few, you know, a couple of girlfriends, you know, who, who, you know, were moms or whatever that, you know, I, I hung out with them and we complained and drank lots of wine. Um, and that helped a lot just to step away, even if it was just for a couple of hours, you know, just having that girlfriend time that is a way, especially because my house is so testosterone laden. 
to <laughs> step out of it and just be like, oh my God, it's so nice to be with women is nice. Um, and I'm sure I have a son in the other room who's like, really, mom, really right now? <laughs> yeah, I but, have like with our kids, our kids are now 19 and 22. So yeah, I was, I was the only girl and it was just even like doing what's considered girly things didn't happen. No, no. it's because it's like, you're not a, you're not a girl. You're not a woman, you're mom. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they would, they would joke with me if my one friend, you know, Colleen would call, they'd be like, Oh, there goes mom for the next, you know, three or four hours. And I, but I'm allowed, you guys are out with your friends and doing stuff fun all the time. And I am just here. So, but it was, su- I, I think it was super important for me back, you know, when I was establishing all this to be that very stable, always there, you know, always reliable kind of, you know, just to set that foundation. And then once they were like, you know, good with that, then it was, okay, now it's my time. I'll probably end up, you know, going out of town a lot. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go actually, out of town a lot. We actually, here's, here's sort of like a, our little tip when it comes to going out of town and leaving your kids. Um, we started doing that when I think, I think our oldest was about 19. And because we had, um, we were living in a different city at the time. And we had our, our home base was on the East coast of Canada. And my husband and I would go back there periodically, or we would go on other little trips. You know, it started off as a weekend and then Mm -hmm. a few days in that. And we, we got them used to being responsible for themselves and it paid off because we were able to get them moved out quite quickly. (laughs) Oh, lucky you. (laughs) It was like, they, yeah, well, we actually, it was a year ago, we decided to move back to our what we call our home base our family home here on the east coast and we just kind of said to the kids you know it was a pandemic and we were dealing with different issues surrounding that and we basically said like we have to go back we can't keep paying for two houses so we need to get you guys moved out and that first year would have been challenging regardless whether they were 19 and 22 or 25 it would have been challenging but they were more prepared because they had had those practice runs. So take more vacations, Dorothy. Yes, I, I'm, I'm hearing you say that right now. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's just it's, training for my children. I and get that's it. it. It's training. <laughs> what a concept. It's not vacation. I'm preparing you to be an adult. <laughs> yes, it's preparation, education, training. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And and we did we did allow parties. And we'd say you're allowed to have five people over knowing that there's probably going to be 10 but if we said 10 there'd be 20 <laughs> so right we kind of manage certain things in certain ways just to you know massage yeah, the I, situation I just I just you know don't I close my eyes I don't want to know <laughs> I come back like I said I come back as long as you know broken bones no one's in the hospital and the pets are alive I'm good it's all good <laughs> it's all good yeah it is So tell me, Dorothy, how did you take that chaos of family life and how did that prepare you for, you know, the chaos of the business world? That is a great question. And I've made that comparison in my own head um, often, actually, because I juggle a bunch of clients and not, not, not tons. I mean, I max out. I think I have like six or seven clients right now, but because I, I have to juggle them and the schedule and all that, I have gotten I got kind of trained, they trained me, my kids trained me in how to make time for each one, how to make each one feel like they're the only one when I need to, how to make each one understand that they're not the only one when I need them to. And I mean, it's not that I treat my clients like children, but it has definitely helped me prioritize my day and not feel guilty if I can't get to one because I know I have dedicated time somewhere else for them. Um, and just in how I, I think even in how I communicate that to them, like, yes, you are important. I am working with you. Here's where I have you on my schedule. Just like I would like maybe with the kids, like, no, I can't take you to that right now, but 
I have you scheduled for, you know, lacrosse practice or basketball practice or whatever. And, and we're going to make all those things on time and keep my commitments to each of those things has helped me also keep my commitments and prioritize them with my clients. That makes a lot of sense. I'd never thought of it that way, but you're right. You do have to there in your family life. There is give and take. You cannot do it all. And you have to have those times where you can say, okay, I can't make this hockey game, but I'm going to be there on Saturday. Yes. You know, you have to be able to do that. And, you know, taking that same perspective into the business world is a perfect shift. Yeah. It worked out really, really well that way. It took me a little bit to realize that it was, you know, they're very similar and, you know, but once I did, it, it definitely made even my own mental health better in my work life because I didn't feel, you know, you feel that same guilt, right? Like when you, when you miss the hockey game or the lacrosse game for us, <laughs> um, it, you feel, you feel, or the practice or whatever, you feel guilty as a parent, you feel guilty. And I think you feel the same way when it's a client, if you can't make that meeting that they were like, Hey, I put this on your calendar, or I want to put this on your calendar. And you're like, I, 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 I can't then like, uh, and I, you, you tend to feel guilty. Like I should be servicing them all the time. Like they're the only client I have. And I think setting, it helps you also set those boundaries and, and, and understanding with your clients when you can kind of take that same thought that you did with your kids and not feel the guilt as much. Cause I always felt guilty with clients. If I was like, no, I can't meet at two. <laughs> I can meet at three. Yay. But um, yeah, I think it was, it was, a, it was a, made that transition a bit easier. And you said that you deal with a lot of women-based, a lot of female-based businesses. Yes. So in your perspective, are more and more women excelling in the business world? And how has the past 18 months of everything we've been dealing with either helped or hindered women in building their businesses? Uh, well, on the first part of that question, I'm finding a lot more women who have, are leaving the corporate world to start their own business. They've had enough of all that patriarchy and all that stuff. So they are now working. <laughs> I know it's like the buzzword, right? But <laughs> they, <shocking>. they, <laughs> oh, my God, but uh, I, nobody knew. Um, but they're leaving that world and starting their own business and realizing oh my God, hey, wait a minute, I can do this. Because I think so many of us, when you're in a corporate world, all you're, not all, but often you're told, you know, no, you can't have that promotion. No, you can't have a raise. No, you can't move to that other department. You know, no, 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 no. And it's really the company and your boss is keeping you where they need to keep you because they don't want to have to replace that role. So you start thinking some subliminally somewhere in your back, you know, of your head, I'm only worthy of that. I can't do all these other things. And then when you become an entrepreneur and you have to do all those things and you realize you can, I think it's incredibly empowering. And so what I have found with women, especially in the last 18 months or so leaving because they could, they had to, they got downsized or whatever, they're all of a sudden saying, oh my God, I can actually do this. Why did I think I couldn't do this? And I think on the second part of that question, the pandemic has helped because so many of us like me, I've worked from home since 2013. I made a big deal about not making it look like I was working from home. Uh, if I heard the dog bark, it was like, who down the hall has their dog in the office? That's so rude. Oh my God. The doorbell would ring and I'd be like, oh yeah, we had that weird doorbell on that bit. You know, I, and it was so silly. And the pandemic made it, it completely acceptable and normal to work from home and do as good a job working from home as you did from the office or better. And I think for a lot of women who are trying to juggle the mom thing, it has allowed them to work from home and people now understand, oh, you're working from home. Okay, cool. And it's not, oh, you're working from home. Oh, so you're only going to have half attention today or, you know, and they've real, the other thing that I think they've all realized as anyone who's worked from home with kids is that that's incredibly hard. Yeah. <laughs> it and is incredibly hard. If my husband actually has been working remotely since I'm going to say late 2006. Oh, wow. And he did fight this. It was constantly, you know, people would be like, well, why don't you come to the office? He's like, well, there's no point. And I think that, you know, the past 18 months has, like you said, it's normalized 
the situation. Yes. And it's off. made, you know, do you remember, what is it, two or three years? Maybe it was longer. The guy that was an expert talking to somebody on CNN or something, and the little girl opens the door where he was talking and comes like, oh, marching in. And that took off like wildfire because people are like, hey, wait a second, it's not just me. And then you see the poor wife like dashing it. <laughs> to try to save it. It's like, but what they did is they said, wait a second, if this guy on, I think it was CNN, can deal with the same stuff that we deal with every day, then how is it wrong? And I think yeah. we've seen more of that. I mean, I, I, you know, my husband's office is right beside mine. So I hear, you know, he's on a conference call and you can hear people trying to deal with their kids. And like you said, trying to deal with the dog and it's normal. And in fact, it's almost made us more human. I would agree. I think it's given us a kind of an insight to people. They are more authentic selves, you know? I mean, no, we can't see that if I'm wearing, you know, sweats or something underneath the, the table, but, um, but it's, you know, even just, you know, looking, you know, back behind somebody and you're like, oh yeah, What's that? You know, I, what is that? <laughs> or wow, they have a lot of books or they must be a reader. I didn't even know. I was talking to somebody the other day. She had this incredible built-in bookshelves behind her and it was just stock full of books. Had no idea she was an avid reader. Well, there you go. Now we have something to talk about. And I, I so I think, and people are a lot more relaxed at home, um, you know, I, I, I've said this before in talking to others that I'm a Gen Xer. So we always, you know, when you're going through your corporate career, it was, you know, personal life is, you don't even talk yeah. about professional life. You're professional. You know, I mean, I remember it's like kids. No, I don't have, what are you talking about? No, those are not mine. <laughs> are you kidding me? But, and again, you know, to go back to the man woman thing, like it was okay for men to have pictures on their desk of their kids because there was a wife at home to take care of them. Yes. But if women had pictures of their kids, it was, I wonder if she's distracted because she's thinking about her kids or does she have her kids on the table, you know, pictures up because she misses them so much and would rather be at home. I was like, Oh my God. Exactly. But now that everybody is in this mix, it's made all of us, you know, a lot more open to, yeah, this is what my life looks like right here. You know, even the kid, I had one of my sons walk through a Zoom conference call that was a board meeting and he in a towel asking where something was. And I'm just like, but nobody said a word. I don't even know if they noticed or they're just like, yeah, that's COVID. <laughs> I had no idea, but I was like, at least Dude. he had a towel on. <laughs> Thank God. Oh man. But I think it's, it's, it's opened us all up for that. And I think now everyone is being a lot more open with their, you know, this is who I am. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not always a super professional person. I most of the time am, and sometimes I'm just not, <laughs> and that's okay. Dorothy, as we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom that you like to share with our listeners? You know, I think really it's it's what we were talking about earlier was just letting go of needing to control absolutely everything and if the pandemic has not shown us anything it has shown us we can't control everything and sometimes you just you know put the guardrails in place for where you want to go but don't be don't be like you know so guardrailed in that you can't make any pivots and and changes and just just really go with it you know we only have one life my mom, I'll probably go on too long with this, but my mom passed away earlier this year. But one of the things she said at the, in the middle of the pandemic was, you know, even if the kids go to school an extra year because of this, who cares? You know, it's, it's just one, you know, time, one year in their life, they'll live until they're 90 and they'll, they'll talk funny about it down the road. So just, you know, roll with things in life. So I try to do that. And I, that's my advice. That makes a lot of sense. And Dorothy, where's the best place for people to connect with you? I am on, I have a website, which is DK East, like the direction, um, dot com. And I'm also on Instagram and that's DK East Asos. So DK E-A-S-T-A-S-S-O-C. Um, that's for DK East Associates, which is my firm. And, um, and then, you know, me personally, I'm on LinkedIn under Dorothy Cole. To connect with Dorothy, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of her links in there. And Dorothy, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. This is great. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. 